Hi, my name is Jonathan Hirsch. I'm the founder and executive director of Included, a nonprofit organization, and I'm here to talk with you today about the future of cities. One in six people in the world today live in a migrant slum. Within a few decades, that number will grow to one in three. I think right now, the migrant slums in Latin America are doubling every probably every 300 years or so. If you look at Asia, where it's a very current issue, they're doubling every 30 to 60 years or so. What happens is that they're expecting a better quality of life. When they are hoeing their plot of land um, in the village where their family has been for hundreds, if not thousands of years, they are probably going to look down at their five-year-old daughter and say, this is no life for the 21st century. They have TV now, they have radio now, and so they can see the possibility of what could be. When they come into the cities, they suddenly bounce back on the edges and land in these informal migrant slums because they're an outsider. They're not able to access formal health care, uh, formal education, formal housing, formal employment. Uh, in essence, they're living informal lives on the edges of our cities, and that causes long-term issues. If you look back at Latin America, you have two to three generations living in the favelas there, and we see that migrants work really hard. Uh, they take advantage of opportunity. They do really well. Why aren't they moving up at least into the lower middle class? Uh, and we bring that back to this issue of informality because they're treated uh, as, as an outsider uh, in their cities. In China even, legally, they're kept out of the system. Back in 1954, 1958, uh, the WHO code, the social security card system, actually legislated them back into their places of birth. And so if they choose to move into Beijing or Shanghai, Shenzhen, uh, many of them, actually all of them at this stage, aren't allowed to carry those formal social benefits with them. It always remains back at their place of birth. Migrant high schoolers are not able to take the university entrance exam in the cities where they maybe have lived informally for 10 years or so. And so the brightest students that their parents might have a chance to go to university actually get sent back at grade nine uh, to live in their villages probably with their grandparents or with their uncles or with their aunts. As an example of what can work, uh, in Shanghai, uh, the government said about four or five years ago that they were going to um, flow all of the informal migrant population of the children into the formal education system. It's a humane issue, but I think it's also a very pragmatic issue as well. As city mayors and city leaders understand that migrants are an asset, uh, they will find ways to flow them into their cities and reward them based on their contributions. in Kathmandu, uh, one of the slums that we were working in and getting closer with and really getting to know the migrants living there. The government came in and demolished them, like many governments do. They try to understand uh, how to clean up their cities. Uh, they don't always understand what the best approach is, and that's their solution. Within probably six hours or so, they set up new tents, new tarps, new bamboo structures just to the side, and a year and a half later, they're still there. It's a very complex issue, and so I think the way that we can all try to support and help uh, governments who are open, and many of them are, uh, to trying to find a better way is to give them examples of what might not have worked in the past, but other examples too of what has actually seemed to work in the last four or five years. I think Latin America, in particular Brazil, have given the world wonderful examples of, of things that might work. After that, it comes down to very pragmatic solutions and hopefully empirical uh, in nature, but actually at the very beginning to catch our attention to hook uh, our attention, we all need to be inspired. If we don't find a way to include the migrants in our cities, I think there are two possible scenarios if you look 30 to 40 to 50 years down the road. Uh, the first is very uh, scary and a, a little bit risky, where you might have hundreds of millions of disenfranchised migrant youth actually not able to access the system. And as you know, youth have a lot of energy and they have a lot of idealism. And there's a lot of activity and action that they will take if they feel like they're not being treated fairly. The second scenario, I think, is a much uh, brighter one. And I think a much more, it's much more possible than the first scenario. And that's one where migrants are recognized as an asset. They help build the cities. They help grow the economies. Uh, they help provide the diversity that's so important to make a very strong city. Either way, we need to include them. As a city leader, I would begin to tax migrants, maybe 3 to 5 percent. In return, of course, I would give them um, social benefits, access to our education systems, our health care systems. But what that does is it addresses very directly this issue of informality. I think that in the coming decade or so, you're going to see corporations and other 
SMEs really begin to see the migrant slums as an opportunity. Uh, we need uh, architects, urban planners, product designers, industrial designers to consider a career uh, that's focused uh, on what will be one third of the world's population. They wouldn't have a lot of competition at this stage, so they can certainly be early movers.